35, 5. Anybody start reading? As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. Okay, so here's, it says there's a great terror on the people. Now, uh, in the Bible, sometimes it'll actually say this is a terror from the Lord. In this case, it doesn't do that. But these guys just killed an entire town by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the people are thinking, man, these are some pretty, pretty brutal people. And so everybody's just scared of them. And it's the opposite of what Isaac had worried about. Isaac was worried, now we're going to be a stench in everybody's nose and they're going to come and kill us. And you know, But anyway, they, the people were obviously quite afraid of what happened and plus they acquired all of the, the wealth and everything of the town that they killed but if I don't know if you know whoever wasn't here in the last week but this is where the um, Dinah the daughter of Israel was molested. It, molested I don't want to say rape because I think it was probably consensual although it doesn't say that she was molested she wasn't married and the son of the town leader of Shechem uh, did it. And so they went through, tried to get the two married, and the brothers were so upset at what happened, they killed the whole town. So that's where we're at right now. Anyway, go ahead. I'm glad you told me, because I couldn't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him, where he fled from his brother. Okay, and once again, what is El Bethel? Work it out in your head. House of God. El El is what? God. Okay. And then house of God. So God, the house of God. That's what El Beth. I, did you say God, the house of God? Or, okay. Okay. So you're right. All right. And I just want you to think the easier words through. And um, let's see here. There God appeared to him when he fled. So this is the same place that when he left in his, uh, what is it? Um, he, uh, his mother told him, flee up there and go get yourself a wife until your brother calms down. And he had the vision of the, uh, Jacob's ladder and the next morning he woke up he, he slept on the stone the next morning he woke up and said surely this is the house of God and so he anointed the stone and then proceeded on up to Padam Aram and on it, at the time he called it Bethel which is the house of God but now it says El Bethel God the house of God so there you go and I didn't hear you say the first part so very good well I think everybody knows El is God there you go well okay all right so um, verse 8 go ahead now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. And it was named Elon Bakuth. Which means the oak of weeping, or the terebinth of weeping, or the great tree of weeping. They're, you know, different people will translate that. Elon? Al Al Alon, yeah. So uh, Elon Bakuth. Now, unfortunately, this Bible, uh, Tom gave me a brand new Bible because mine's just falling, page is falling out. And um, this one doesn't have all of the little translations in there that I had in my old Bible. So I'll have to just do the best I can with you all. But anyway, please, nine. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram, and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he, was, he called him Israel. Okay, so he's already called him Israel. Remember back up at Peniel where he had the, the fight at night with the uh, angel of the Lord? And he said, bless me. And he says, I won't bless you until uh, uh, you tell me your name. And he, Well, anyway, and he changed his name to Israel. So this is the second time he's confirming the name of Israel to him. And... Just so you know where we're at. They're in Israel at this time, but we'll say this is Israel. This is my terrible drawing as before. Pan and Moran is up in this area over here. This is where he went to get his wife and where uh, Abraham was. And then, uh, what's his name, uh, Isaac, uh, his wife Rebecca came from here. Anyway, so now he's gone back down in there at Bethel here. And uh, that's the area that we're talking about. And then I had a point to tell you. Um, your God, oh, so he names his name from Jacob here, but he did it originally right up here at the place called Peniel, where they had the, the struggling at the, uh, the ford of the river. Anyway, so this is the second time he's done that. And once again, what does Jacob mean? Yaakov? Deceiver. Deceiver, and, which is an idiom from the actual meaning heel grabber because he came out of the womb grabbing his brother's heel. But a heel grabber is also a deceiver. So he changed his name to Yisrael, which means he struggles with God. 
Remember, it's a double entendre. When they're in God's favor, they're struggling on behalf of God. And when they're not in God's favor, they're struggling against God. So the name of Israel is throughout the Bible. It's, an, it's basically a double entendre. And uh, some, some translators will say prince of God instead of he struggles with God. But generally, it's people note it as he struggles with God is what Yisrael means. Okay, please go ahead. God also said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. Same promise made to Abraham, same promise made to Isaac. He is the son of promise. And so um, a company of nations, and that's kind of the same thing that was said to Ishmael. Even though Ishmael wasn't the son of promise, he was still promised 12 rulers would come to him. So just as Ishmael had 12 rulers come from him, Israel did as well. And they've already been named. We've already gone, uh, who was it? Uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, uh, Dan. Manasseh. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, no, not yet. Then Manasseh is the children of uh, Joseph. But we have Dad, uh, Dan, uh, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, the 12 sons of Israel. And then Joseph's sons are Manasseh and Ephraim. So there you go. Okay. Um, uh, okay, please, go ahead. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Okay, and nothing has changed. This is to the physical descendants of Abraham. And we've talked about this. You've, you've missed a lot about the, the history of this land, but this does not belong to the church. The church did not replace Israel. That's covenant theology, and they say that. I, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Some people would stand up and be argumentative about that, but I, we, just in no way do I believe that we own the land. The Jewish people own the land, despite their unfaithfulness. Go ahead. How did, you, you've touched on covenants a number of times, but tell me how you decipher uh, a covenant at Colonel. Dispensationalism is a... No, oh. Well, unconditional. Anytime God makes a covenant, unless he says, if you do these things, it's unconditional. If he speaks, it's unconditional. But there are times that it's conditional, such as in Deuteronomy. And Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. If you obey the words of this law, these things will happen. That's right. And so that, that's the difference. But now, covenant theology says that God made these covenants and that eventually... It, it turns into what's called replacement theology, where the church replaces Israel. And the reason why I'm going to explain this, just because they haven't heard this, and this is important, is when Israel was exiled in A.D. 70, and the church became God's uh, workings on earth, what happened is the people read these Old Testament promises that are as yet unfulfilled, and they said, hmm, well, there's no longer a Jewish nation. And I mean, who would think there's a pocket of Jews, five people here, five people here, all over. There, you'll find a synagogue in Japan with a couple people in it. You'll find one in China. They're all over the world. They were totally unconnected. There's no communication between them. And nobody would have thought, oh, someday they're going to be back in the land of Israel. And so the church says, well, we've got this problem. We've got all of these unfulfilled promises. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to give you this land, the Valley of Dry Bones, and, you know, Ezekiel 36 through 39. And um, so the church says, we must be spiritual Israel. Okay? And so that's why you hear all these songs where, you know, Israel, this and that, applying it to the church, when in fact that's not the case. And if it, anything is evidence of that, how people can't change their theology in thinking, is the fact that the Jews are back in the land now. And was that a mistake? I mean, did, did God not know that that was going to happen? You know what I'm saying? If you look at it from today's perspective, but back in the, say, the 15 and 1600s, it's fully believable. There was absolutely nothing in this land. There were no trees. There was one rainy year, not enough to, to sustain the land. There's uh, uh, no people at all to speak of. There were, you know, small groups of people, but very little. And one thing I brought up many times in this class, but just so you're aware of this, Mark Twain went on a trip of the entire biblical lands, Greece and, you know, Patmos and all this. Eventually he got up here and he traveled from Dan all the way through Beersheba in Israel. And he documented it. You can read it right online. It's called Innocence Abroad. Very short book. And I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T-S. Anyway, 
he, he documents exactly how many people are there and what breed of people there, whether they're Jews, whether they're Arabs, whether they're Bedouins, whatever. And everything that you hear in the news about the Palestinians and their right to the land is totally a lie. This guy was an unbiased person. This was long before this land was resettled. Nobody was in there, just a few you know, people throughout the land. And a lot of them were Christians that were living there, you know, just the way they had over the years, trying to keep the holy land, holy sites going. Anyway, it's all documented in there. He tells exactly how many people are in Jerusalem, for example, how many are Muslims, how many are Jews, whatever. And um, uh, it, as I said, it was an unbiased thing. And all of this land was owned at the time by the Ottoman Empire. Okay, and nobody wanted to live there because what had happened is here you've got the Nile River and eventually it branches out into the, the, the valley and all of this sand washes out of the Nile year after year for thousands of years and it went and it plugged up all of the rivers that were flowing off of the mountains. And so what happened is all of this became swamps because the water can't flow out. All right. And there's no trees. The Romans cut down every tree in the land in order to build siege works to take the Jews out of the land. Okay? So, what is happening? Even if you go there to this day, there's a lot of sand in this area, but the beaches are getting smaller because now they have the Aswan Dam and it's not letting the same amount of sand go in there. So, they're actually losing these beaches. But all of this sand was piling up. There's dysentery, there's malaria, there's all of this, this um, uh, inability to sustain anything. And so the people that traveled through here and made these commentaries, they just wanted to see where Jesus was. That's all. There was no bias in it or anything. Long before Zionism started. Well, anyway, the Jewish people for 2,000 years on the Passover ceremony, the last thing they say is they hold up their cup and they say, next year, next year in Jerusalem. They've been doing this for 2,000 years. This is our home. We can't wait to return. And eventually, in the 1800s, um, uh, well, I won't get into the prophecies, but they are fulfilled literally to the day in the Bible. I can show you, take a, quite a study, but the prophecies were filled to the day that the Jewish nation would be reestablished. You can get it right out of the Bible. I mean, literally to the day. Okay, so the Jewish people started in about the 1860s or 1870s to go in and buy this land from the Ottoman Empire. And the Muslims, these are those stupid Jews, they're buying nothing. And they're paying exorbitant prices because they knew these people wanted the land. So they're paying huge sums of money for something that nobody wanted. There's, you can't build on it. It's all swamp. It's all disgusting. There's no over in this area. It's all dry with no trees. Well, what did the Jews do? They actually got to work. They started to drain these swamps. They got the rivers flowing again. What does that produce? The greatest Fertile soil on earth. They get more bumper crop than we do in America. Their cows produce more milk than American cows. So this is, but they bought this land at the cost of their own lives because many, many of them died of these diseases. But they also, some of them came from Australia. And when they did, they brought eucalyptus trees up. And mom and I have seen them. They're, they're massive. That have been there for a hundred and some years since they bought this land, draining the swamps the way we did in the Everglades. So all of this is now fertile soil. And guess what? All of a sudden, everybody wants it again. Well, nobody wanted it for 2,000 years. And this was God's curse on the land. And it's right in the Bible. We don't need to guess, was this God's providence or not? We know that it was God's providence. And then he says, I'm going to restore my people of Israel. And he wasn't talking about the church. He was talking about these disobedient people who to this day haven't called on their Lord. No surprise to him. They will. The Bible is very clear on that. We can talk about all these different things. But I wanted you to understand what's going on with what we're reading right here. Most of these people, what yes. What is this land called right now? Uh, uh, is this Canaan? I mean, you mean in the Bible? No, or what, what, this, is, this is Israel. This is the land of Israel. So when you hear about like the West Bank, that's this area, the West Bank of the River Jordan. And then this is the Gaza Strip over here which basically has the same, several of the same names that are actually in the Bible. Gaza has, uh, it's Gaza, but they have um, uh, uh, Ashkelon and a couple of the, the same names that are still there. There were five kings in this Gaza area. Anyway, so it's Israel, but for the, where the term Palestine came from is from, in the Bible you have the people called the Philistines. They're invaders. They came from this area, Crete in that area, and they came in and it, it, they were invaders to Israel. And so, when the Romans exiled these people out of here, the Jewish people, they didn't want the name Israel to be applied to the land. So what they did is they said, this is now Palestina, 
which is the, the, the name from Philistine, they changed it to Palestine. 